Hi, everyone. If you don't know me, I'm Skip Tyler. I'm a teaching elder at New Life in Christ Church. And welcome to our final class in our series of Systematic Theology 2, where we're looking at various topics of the Westminster Confession of Faith. Um, it's the day before Thanksgiving, so I want to wish everyone a happy Thanksgiving. And today we're going to be looking at lawful, lawful oaths and vows. Now, if you might be thinking, I didn't think we were supposed to make an oath. I didn't think we were supposed to do that. Well, if you look at Matthew 5, 33, 37, this is what Jesus says about, about swearing. Again, you have heard that it is said to those of old, you shall not swear falsely, but shall perform to the Lord what you have sworn. But I say to you, do not take an oath at all, either by heaven, for it is the throne of God, or by the earth, for it is his footstool, or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. And do not take an oath by your head, for you cannot make one hair white or black. Let what you say simply be yes or no. Anything more than that comes from evil. Now, we're, we're going to address this. This isn't really talking about uh, swearing, uh, taking a lawful oath. It's talking more, mainly about um, swearing in something other than God is what this verse is talking about. But we'll address it later. I come from a, I come from a family that... Uh, <laughs> I hate to admit this. I come from a family that had, that in our early days we had a hard time telling the truth, and the reason why we had a hard time telling the truth was my father was a person that could tell a story, and he could tell you a story, and you know ten percent of it might be true, but the story would be so believable because it always did sound believable, and then we'd find out later, you know, in life that all these stories that our dad had told us were were untrue. And, uh, and even growing up, because of the example my, my dad said, sometimes uh, in my family, we would embellish a little bit of what, um, uh, what was being said. We, we called it the Tyler 10% rule that, you know, 10% of what we're saying might, you know, not necessarily be true. But we had this problem when we were younger, because when we would tell each other stuff as children, we weren't sure if the other person was telling us the whole truth, nothing but the truth, so help help him God. So my brother would say, I said, Michael, I don't think that's even true. And he would say something like, uh, cross my heart, hope to die, stick a thousand needles in my eye. And that would be what my brother would do to, to, to swear. When we got when we got older and became adults and um, we want, want to embellish the truth a little bit, my sister would say to me, or to my brother, she says, Skipper, say that in Jesus' name, <laughs> trying to find out if I was really telling the truth or not. But but anyway, these are these are things that people do, you know, to try to, you know, show some kind of veracity that they are telling the truth and they and they want to invoke something. Well, that's all not scriptural. We're not supposed to, we're not supposed to do those kind of things. But um that's my introduction to um lawful oaths and uh, vows. So what, you know, what is a lawful oath? And we're going to look at chapter 22 of the Westminster Confession of Faith, paragraph one. It says, a lawful oath is part of a religious worship, wherein upon just occasion, the person swearing solemnly calls God to witness what he has asserts or promises and to judge him according to the truth of, or falsehood of what he swears. Now, today I'm going to be relying um, on, on Hodge in his... Um, uh, commentary on the Westminster Confession of Faith. But this is a verse in Deuteronomy 10, 20 that talks about swearing. You shall fear the Lord your God, you shall serve him and hold fast to him, and by his name you will swear. Hodge says, a lawful oath consists in calling upon God, the occasion being of sufficient seriousness and importance to witness the truth of what we affirm is true, or to or, or our voluntary assumption of an obligation to do something in the future with an implied imprecation of God's favor if we lie or prove unfaithful to our engagements. The last is generally expressed by the phrase forming the concluding part of the formula of most oaths, so help me God. Let God so help me as I have told the truth, or I will keep, or as I will keep my promise. Now, uh, you know, usually in, in our daily lives, we don't, we don't uh, have to take an oath. Now, when, if you were in the military and you, um, you had to take an oath that you would uh, support and defend the Constitution of the United States. If you're a federal government employee, you have to take an oath 
uh, one person re-enlists, they take the oath again. Um, and there might be, if you're in court and, um, you know, they swear you in as a witness, uh, you would um, also, you know, so help me God, or I solemnly swear. When all, as my, when I was in the Air Force, when we would ask somebody to swear, um, if they didn't want to swear, we would say they would affirm uh, versus swearing. But these are all sayings that I'm going to promise to do what I, I'm going to do what I promised, and God help me that I've, you know, told you the truth and that I will keep my my promise, and that that is a lawful oath, and there's nothing uh, strictly wrong with that. Hence, an oath is an act of supreme religious worship, even if not a part of worship. Now, this is from Hodge, and I stuck in the part, even if not part of a worship. So if really, when you take a oath at work or an oath in a court of law, that is religious worship, uh, because you're, you're recognizing that there is a God uh, and that he's sovereign and that uh, uh, he's going to judge you for what you say if you say a falsehood. In paragraph two of the confession in chapter 22, the name of God only is that by which men ought to swear and therein is to be used with all holy fear and reverence. Therefore to swear vainly or rashly by that glorious and dreadful name or to swear at all by any other thing is sinful and to be abhorred. Yet as in matters of weight and moment, an oath is warranted by the word of God under the New Testament as well as under the old. So a lawful oath being imposed by a lawful authority in such matters ought to be taken. I think it's I think it's Jehovah Witnesses that don't um, you know that they won't take an take an oath, but the uh, uh, confession clearly teaches that that is that is okay to do. And Hodge writes this, and I think this is important to realize that um, what happens if you swear if you're not if you're not a Christian. It follows that it is a sin equivalent to that of worshiping a false god if we swear by any other than the only true and living God, and the sin of idolatry if we swear by anything or place, although, it's, it is, although it be associated with the true God. Those who swear with uplifted hands swear by God, who created, preserves, and governs all things. Those who swear with hands upon or kissing the Bible swear by the God who reveals himself in the Bible, that is, by the true Christian God. It is evident that none who believe in the true God can consistently, with their integrity, swear by a false God. And it is no less evident that it is dishonest for an atheist to go through the form of swearing at all, or for an infidel to swear with his hand upon the Christian scriptures, therefore professing to invoke a God whose existence they do not believe. So, this, you know, we're not supposed to swear by anything other than by God, but if you're a non-Christian, and uh, you know, you put your hand up on the Bible and you swear to say the whole truth, nothing but the truth. So help me God. Um, you know, that's that's really should not really congruent with who you really are, and it's something that should not really be imposed by an atheist. He should be asked to to uh, tell the truth and to affirm that he's telling the truth. Uh, but to for him to invoke God's name on it would be would be uh, not right. Is paragraph three, whosoever taketh an oath ought to duly to consider the weightiness of so solemn an act, and therefore avouch nothing but what he is uh, fully persuaded is the truth. Neither may any man bind himself by oath to anything but what is good and just, and what he believeth so to be, and what he is able and resolved to perform. Yet it is a sin to refuse an oath touching anything that is good, and just and just be imposed by lawful authority. So if you wanted to say, you know, if you were, um, you know, Christian and an adherent to the um, Westminster Standards, uh, if if they asked you to uh, swear an oath, uh, you can't you can't re to refuse that would be a sin. Uh, you know, you know, as I went through this, I knew that was correct. But you know, something that we don't, you know, this is an area that we don't really think a lot a whole lot about, especially in the Confession of Faith. Uh, because there's so many weightier things that we think about, but you know, being able to tell the truth when asked upon, especially in the judicial proceeding, is is very important and is as important as a lot of other things that are in the confession. 
I really like what Hodge says here about about this uh, this this one section. The literal meaning of the third commandment is, "Thou shalt not take the name of thy God uh, in that which is false." That is, to confirm an untruth. The command not to take a false oath or any oath upon a trif trifling trifling occasion, by implication, carries with it permission to call upon God of truth to confirm the truth upon all worthy occasions. Hence, oath is enjoined. Of the Old Testament as a recognized religious institution. Christ himself, when put upon an oath in a form common among the Jews, did not hesitate to answer. Paul often appeals to God for the truth of his statements. Thus, God is my witness. I call God for a record upon my soul. Paul declares that God, in order to show unto the heirs of the promise the immutability of his counsel, confirms it by an oath. And because he could swear by no greater, he swears by himself. So this is, you know, what we want don't want to do is 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 say something that's false. We want to say that what is true, and and to do that by God, is is not a sin. It's evident, therefore, that the words of our Savior, what we read in Matthew 35, 33 through thirty seven, swore not at all, cannot be intended to forbid swearing upon proper occasions in the name of the true God, but it was designed to forbid calling upon. His name in ordinary conversation or trifling occasions and the swearing by that which is not God. And this is, you know, this is the thing that we we need to remember as we work through these things about vows and oaths. When we are talking about something, we want to be able to tell the truth about something. We don't want to embellish, you know, the details. Um, we want to be able to say what happened and that, you know, if God was the, you know, God's there listening to us. If he could speak to us right then uh, with a voice and say, uh, you got that right or you got that wrong. We we needed to, to be able to, when we say things, to think about God being there. He's, he uh, he sees all. He's right there with us and will judge us by what we by what we say. The proper occasions upon which an oath may be taken are those in which serious and perf perfectly law full interest or involved and in which an appeal to the witness of God is necessary to secure confidence and strife. And also whenever an oath is imposed by competent authority upon those subject to it, in the last case, our confession says that taking the oath is a duty and refusal is a sin. Paragraph four. An oath is to be taken in the plain and common sense of the words without evocation or mental reservation. It cannot oblige to sin, but in anything not sinful being taken, it binds to performance, although to a man's own hurt, nor is it to be violated, although made uh, to heretics or infidels. So even if you're making your, your oath to heretics and infidels, you still need a truth. Uh, you know, this verse of, um, of uh, to a man's hurt, that verse is found in, in the Psalms. And this is a verse that Pastor Doug uh, has, has talked about. And, and it goes more than just an oath that when you tell somebody you're going to do something, uh, we need to do that thing even if it's uh, to our own hurt. Um, and I mean, I think that, especially in these days, people's, um, uh, you know, when, you, when a person gives you his word, it might not be like it was 50 years ago. I can remember, um, you know, with my grandfather that to him that, you know, if he gave his word to somebody, uh, regardless of the pain that it caused him, he was going to fulfill that promise that he, he said, even though it wasn't in the sense of, a, of an oath or a vow. The oath is always to be interpreted and kept sacred by the person taking it in the sense in which he honestly believes that he's understood by the person who imposes it. It is evident that that if the government, the judge, the magistrate, or a private fellow citizen require an oath from us for their satisfaction, and if we put a private sense upon that matter upon which we invoke the witness of God, different from that which we know they understand by it, then we deceive them intentionally, and by calling God to witness our truth while we are engaged in very active lie, we commit the sin of perjury. The obligation of an oath arises, A, out of the original and universal obligation to speak the truth and to keep faith in all engagements, and B, in addition to this, our obligation to honor God and to avoid dishonoring him by invoking his witness to a falsehood, and C, the profanity 
involved in suspending our hopes of God's favor upon the truth of that which we know and intend to be false. And an oath cannot bind to that which itself is unlawful, because the obligation of the law is imposed upon us by the will of God, and therefore takes precedence by all obligations imposed upon us by the will of man or by ourselves, and the lesser obligation cannot relieve from the greater. The sin in taking the oath to do the unlawful thing, not in breaking it. Therefore, Luther was right in breaking his monastic views. Neither can an oath do that which is impossible uh, which is impossible bind or its impossibility is expression of the will of God. So, I mean, this is where uh, um, Martin Luther had taken a, um, a vow to be a monk, but because it was, um, uh, there was a greater, there was a greater law that he needed to fulfill than being a monk. That's why he was right in breaking his monastic vow. Um, and a lot of people did during the Reformation where they broke their vows uh, because there was a greater obligation they needed to keep uh, to God, which was not in that monastic form. Paragraph five, a vow is like the nature with a, a vow is of the like nature with a promissory note and ought to be made with the like religious care and to be performed with like faithfulness. Now I said promissory note, I meant promissory oath. The vow is promised, the vow is a promise made to God. In the oath, the parties are both men and God is invoked as a witness. In the vow, God is the party to whom the promise is made. It is of like nature with an oath because we are bound to observe them on the same grounds. Because of our obligation to truth and because of our obligation to reverence God, lightly to vow on a trif trifling occasion or having vowed, failed to keep it is an act of profanity of God. You know, um, I know this is pretty much uh, uh, gets right into the nuts and bolts of all these these um, um, paragraphs about vows and legal oaths. But it just shows you by just reading through, especially Hodge, that um, this is very serious stuff, that, that you need to be able to um, tell the truth all the time and not to mislead people. Uh, and to, um, because if you do, you're really profaning God. Uh, even if it's not in the oath, the person knows you're a Christian and you're not, you know, telling the truth or doing what you say you're going to do, uh, and you call yourself a Christian, that is uh, that is not a good thing. Paragraph six: It is not to be made to any creature but to God alone, and that it may be accepted. It is to be made voluntarily out of faith, in conscience of duty, in the way of thankfulness for mercy received or for obtaining what we want, whereby we more strictly bind ourselves to the necessary duties or to other things so far and so long as they may fitly conduce their unto, which this is what it means. A vow cannot, cannot bind to do that which is unlawful or impossible for reasons which before explained in relation to an oath, nor one made by a child or person under authority and destitutes of the right to bind themselves of their own will. Now we have this passage in, in Numbers uh, 31 through 8. And th this is the, we're not, we don't have time to go into it right now. Uh, but if you were to look this passage up, this is where um, if a woman uh, makes a vow and her husband knows about it, and he knows about it right when she makes it, he can, he can uh, uh, stop the vow. But if he concurs and then he can't change his mind later and say, no, she doesn't, um, she doesn't have to do that. Um, and that's where um, that the oaths and vows all fall under the authority that you're under. You can't uh, vow for something to something that you don't have authority over. Nor can it continue to bind in cases in which its continued observance is found clearly to be inconsistent with our spiritual interests. For then it is certain that God does not wish it, and a promise can never bind when the party to whom it's made does not desire it kept. And this is the last uh, paragraph. No man may vow to do anything forbidden in the word of God or what would hinder any duty therein commanded or which is not in his own power and for the performance whereof hath, he hath no promise of ability from God. In which respects popish monastical views of a perpetual single life, professed poverty and regular obedience are 
so far from being degrees of higher perfection that they are superstitious and sinful snares in which the Christian may entangle himself. When the manner of a vow is not unlawful, but morally indifferent, the vow is binding, but experience abundantly proves to be to accumulate such obligations is very injurious. The word of God in scriptures imposes upon us by his authority all that is his will or for our interest for us to observe. The multiplication of self-imposed duties dishonors him and greatly harasses and endangers our safety. Vows had better be restricted to the voluntary assumption and promise to observe with the help of divine grace, duties imposed by God and plainly revealed in the scriptures. So the, the short and long of it when it comes to vows is we, we don't want to take vows um, um, uh, for no reason. Uh, the only reason that we should take a vow is when we're asked to take one, um, unless there's you know special circumstances where a Christian feels like he's um, under obligation to do a vow for something. But uh, the the when you look at what a real legal oath is, a legal vow according to what the Westminster Confession of Faith, it it really comes close to uh, the only ones that you would ever make would be a, a formal a swearing in it and you know like in a judicial uh, situation or, or something else but that doesn't mean that we should not all that we should not always tell the truth and that we tell the truth like we are under oath and if we don't tell the truth then we're really profaning the name of god if we call ourselves a christian so let's pray father we're thankful for this lesson today we just pray uh in our daily walk in our daily speech that we always tell the truth and that uh, if we do invoke a, um, an oath in your name, Father, that we would do that judiciously and not very often, but that when we would do it, we would take it very seriously as an act of religious worship as we uh, uh, try to live our lives to follow you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.